All right. Good morning. It's a lively bunch out there. Can you all hear me okay? All right. I can always count on you. I appreciate it, brother. Well, I got the hands-free mic finally. That way, I'm not sitting here passing everything back and forth, making that... Oh, man, that stuff was driving me nuts. Yeah, exactly. Poor Becky, she'd have to try to drown that out whenever she was editing everything. But um, I have the, the, the privilege and the honor to be able to be in a phenomenal line of, of pastors here. And uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's extremely humbling, honestly, whenever I, I listen to your guys' teachings and then um, I get up here and I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. It really is, honestly. Can you turn that down just a teeny tiny bit? Thanks. Um, so a couple weeks ago, Rod was teaching a, a two-part message, I believe, on what time is it? And he did an outstanding job, brought so much depth and understanding, and, and Scott has been revealing different um, things that God is downloading in him and the, uh, the time that we're in and the season that we're going through. And and it's no doubt that we are in a, a pretty amazing season in life. We're definitely in a place that, that nobody before us has gone. You know, this, uh, uh, all the changes that are coming about, it's pretty, pretty significant, and you can't really miss it. You know, everywhere you look, you're seeing the changes and kind of uh, almost unrest and, and questions of uncertainty and stuff like that. Well, the... Uh, the title that, that God gave me is The Time is Now. The Time is Now. We can't go back. We can look back. You know, we can, we can see what's happened in history. We can, we can project forward. We can, we can hope that we know what's coming in the future. And honestly, God lays it out in, in His Word for us what is going to happen in the future. But there's still uncertainties as far as what's going to happen with our own personal lives, right? And we question, what, what does this look like for me? What does it look like for my children? What does it look like for my children's children, maybe, if, if God doesn't come back by then? Um, and so in some of my reading, God gave me uh, a verse, Jeremiah 12, 5, and as I'm reading through it, like you can see that Becky did an awesome job picking the picture because um, I was bouncing back and forth on whether or not I was going to name this um, compete with horses or run with horses or the time is now. And ultimately, because of all the information that God was giving me, we chose the time is now. But Jeremiah 12, 5 says, if you run with footmen and they have tired you out, how then how will you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? Thicket is a dense group of bushes or trees. That's what thicket is. And he's talking about this thicket is growing up on the side of the Jordan. What's interesting about this verse is that right before this, Jeremiah was just complaining to God. Ultimately, he was complaining, he was whining, he was crying about stuff. And God answers him without addressing what he was saying whatsoever. Have you ever noticed that God does that like consistently throughout the Bible? You know, even the woman at the well. We were going over this in our Bible study uh, a couple weeks ago. The woman at the well is talking to, talking to Jesus and she's asking him very pointed, specific questions. And he just poop, blows right by those questions and tells her what he wants her to know. And that's what, that's what God's doing right here for Jeremiah. He's, he's, he's focused on the circumstances and the situations that he's dealing with right now, right here in front of him. It's the things that he can see, touch, smell, feel, all these things. And that's what he's complaining about. He's worried. He's concerned about what's going on. And Jesus or God straight up tells him, if you run with footmen and they have tired you out, how will you compete with the horses? He's telling him, bud, things are going to get worse. Things are going to get harder. 
You have to shift your focus off of where you're focusing onto my truths, my promises for you. This is what you have to focus on. That's how you're going to overcome. So let's pray real quick. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will just give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. Speak to us, Lord, your word, which you want us to receive today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so that's Jeremiah 12, 5. If y'all want to look it up, outline it, underline it, whatever, I would recommend it. And I hope that this will constantly come back to you throughout the rest of your life, throughout the course of this journey that we're on, okay? It's, God uses very strong language here. You know, he's, he's literally telling him, if you're running with these footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, what are you going to do? How are you going to walk? How are you going to stand? How are you going to move forward in the land that I'm giving you? It's the land, it's right next to the Jordan River. The thicket is so thick because the ground is so lush. It's so lush. It's so dense because it's where God has deposited these nutrients that the river is providing, this river of life. And God's telling him, you're going to be going through the thicket. I'm going to put you in this place of blessing. I'm going to give you what you need to survive. I'm going to provide for you the things that you need. But look, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. You're still going to have to do something. You're going to have to work for it. You might slip. You might fall. You need to strengthen yourself now. So how do we do that? This word, he gave, us, he gave me this word, but I feel like that it's a word for all of us today, right? And not even just in this town, not just in this county or this state or even in this country. This is a worldwide thing that we're all, that we're all dealing with. God is preparing his church. He's preparing his bride and he needs us to open up our eyes. He needs us to get our eyes fixed where he wants them so that we can see him, so that we can prepare ourselves mentally, spiritually, and emotionally for what's to come. So, if we can't handle what's going on in the world right now, how are we ever going to make it through the hard days to come? We have to get our focus off the evil around us the evil in the government, the stripping away of our freedoms, and focus on the source of our true freedom, which is Christ Jesus. I, I hate making things political, but the, the political atmosphere that we're in right now is doing one of two things for us. It's either shifting our focus completely away from God, or it's pushing our focus completely to God. Because who here agrees that the government isn't going to answer all of our problems, right? Who here agrees that we can't answer our own problems? You know, we can't handle our own problems. We have to have God's help. We have to. We absolutely have to. And I, I would like to just encourage you guys that this is where we are right now as a community, as a church, as a country, a nation, as the world, what we're dealing with right now is nothing compared to what's to come. That's why Jesus dropped this bombshell. He said, if you can't, run with the footman. What he's talking about right now is we're just running this race with the footman. We have horses that we have to try to keep up with. This is just, just a little, it's a little glimpse of what's to come. And you know how, how the Word tells us not to, not to boast about what we're going to do um, tomorrow or the next day because we don't know what's to come tomorrow or the next day. But what we do know, what we do know beyond the shadow of a doubt, that God is our hope and our strength. He's our place of refuge. He's our source of all of our hope. We need to use this time as a time to prepare as a time of preparation. But I don't know if any of you are like me, but sometimes I, I can get home and I've got a long laundry list of things that I need to get done. You know, I've got to work on the house. I've got to work on the yard. I've got to go take care of this and that. But there are times where I'm just like, no, I'm just not going to do it. I need to sit down and just rest. 
Well, you know what? Unfortunately, I think our time to sit down and rest is coming to an abrupt end. And it's going to be time to put our nose down to the grindstone and get to work. So, 1 Timothy 6, 6. I'm going to be um, in 1 Timothy a little bit, but then I'm going to 2 Peter, and I'll be in 2 Peter for um, a little bit as well, and then I'm going to 1 Timothy. If you want to follow along, you most certainly can. Don't feel like you have to, though. 1 Timothy 6, 6 says godliness, and I, and I am briefly paraphrasing, so you can jump in and, and see the full thing if you'd like. 1 Timothy 6, 6 says godliness with contentment equals great gain. He doesn't say that godliness by itself equals great gain. He says godliness with contentment because who in here knows godly people that aren't very content and they're not very fun to be around? You know, sometimes, sometimes that's the, the fact, and I hate that. Um, sometimes I'm not content, but he's talking about with contentment. He puts that with contentment in there for a reason, you know, because, and I'm not talking about contentment with where you are in your relationship with God, where you are in your walk with Christ Jesus. What I'm talking about is contentment with the life that God has given you with the earthly things that you have, if you're constantly seeking to get more earthly things, then your focus is in the wrong spot. So he's saying godliness with contentment equals great gain. If you have godliness and you're content, you've gained more than if you can compile all of the wealth of the world. Because this wealth in this world, it's quickly fading. It's going away. But how can we be content if we're constantly in this state of fear, if we're constantly in a state of unrest, if we're constantly in a state of, of what's going to happen next? What, what, what happens if, if, this, if this people group get elected? Or what happens if this people group get elected? I'll tell you what, the same outcome. <laughs> the same outcome, you know why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was at the beginning, he is now, and he's going to last far longer than any governmental structure that could ever be put in place. Now, am I saying that one outweighs another? Yeah, that one does definitely outweigh another, and it does affect our way of life here. But I'm telling you, we've got to keep our focus in the right spot, in the right spot. So how, how do we focus on being content without fear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second Peter 1, verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything, and everything means everything. It truly does. That his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So, so how do we get that? We get that divine power that he's granted to us, he's given to us, he's provided to us. It's ours to have. We can possess it. We have it. We can absolutely have it. And it, it's granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. If you, if you are wondering, how can I be godly? How can I be godly? You can be godly through the power that God has given you, through his power, through his grace, through his strength, through his mercy, through his knowledge. And it says, through the true knowledge of him who called us. How do we truly know somebody, though? If I don't spend any time with Jim, I'm not going to know him intimately, personally. If I don't spend any time with Rod, I'm not going to know his wants, his desires, his likes, his dislikes. I'm not going to know those things. But it says that he grants us this power through the true knowledge of him who called us. He called me. He called you by his own glory. By his own glory. And another, another version says, to his own glory and excellence or and virtue. He's calling us. 
and giving the, us the ability to walk out, to live out, to live in, to dwell in this relationship with him in his glory and in his excellence or in his virtue, in his virtue. We can obtain these things through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. They're ours. It says that he has granted them to us, this divine power. I love it. I love it. But we must learn to trust God first. We must learn to trust God first. If somebody walks in that back door and you've never met them before, it's going to be kind of hard to trust them, right? Because you don't know their intentions. You don't know their heart, their desire for you. You don't know if they're here to help you, to love you, or to hurt you. You don't know. You've got to know them. And in, in knowing God, that's where that trust will be built that's where that trust will be gained. We have to discipline our hearts and minds to stay in tune with the Word of God and to hear what the Spirit is saying. We don't like the word discipline, do we? No. Discipline's not fun. It's not fun. I got disciplined for a lot of things as a kid, but guess what? Then I grew up and I still get disciplined for things. <laughs> Not from my mom and dad necessarily, but I still get disciplined. But the word says that God disciplines us because he loves us. He wants to keep us on the right path. So let me tell you what the, uh, the definition of discipline is. This is two-part. It says, the practice of training someone to obey rules and or a code of behavior. Training someone. Training someone. The other is a branch of knowledge, typically one studied in higher education. So you can practice a discipline. You can learn a discipline. You can learn a trade, something like that. A discipline is learning how to do something the proper way. But it's also the practice of training someone to obey rules or a code of behavior. Whenever I was a kid, I knew what my, expect, what my parents' expectations were. But I had to learn the hard way a lot of times, right? And so I would even know the right thing to do, but I would purposefully choose to do the other thing. And I got disciplined a few times. Um, but my parents, they wanted to train me to obey the rules because they knew what would be best for me. And I use this kind of, I use this analogy whenever I talk to some people that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus, don't have a relationship with God maybe. And I, I, I refer to us as, as like little children before we know right from wrong, before we mature in our faith and, and I refer to God as the adult in the room. And kids, we, we train kids with these little boxes that have the little different shapes cut out. And they, they learn to put the circle in the circle and the square in the square. And so they're always wanting to put the circle in the circle. And when they do, we praise them. We're like, hey, good job, you did it. You know, like it's the, the greatest achievement in the world. And then they find this little shiny metal fork and then they see a light socket, and they're like, okay, I know the game here. You put this in there. And then all of a sudden, they go to do it, and, and the adult's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. And they're like, what are you talking about? This is what I do. This is, this is what I've always done, and you love it when I do this. You know, you give me treats and stuff. It's great. But God knows what's on the other side of that, right? He knows that if you do stick that in there, it's going to be really, really bad for you. And so that's, I use that as, as kind of an analogy to help people understand that, that even though the act of that or the act of something that we've been doing throughout our life is, is not necessarily bad, but in the wrong context, it is definitely bad, you know? And we have to trust 
the one that created us, that knows us inside and out, that loves us so deeply and intimately that he doesn't want us to shove that fork in that light socket because it's really, really, really going to hurt, you know? And so we have to trust that his discipline in that is, is right. It's true. If a kid goes to put their hand on a hot stove, they might get their hand smacked and they might feel that pain, but it's going to be way better than having their whole hand blistered up, right? And dealing with, with all of that. So sometimes we have to go through a little bit of pain so that we, we do what's very best for us. And God truly knows what's best for us, but we're going to have a hard time trusting him if we don't know him. If we don't know him, know him. You know, we can know of somebody. Honestly, if, if the president walked through the door right now, I know who it is, but I can't tell you if he likes chicken or steak better. You know, I don't know him. I know of him. I can watch TV about him all day long, but I don't know him. And that's where we have to get so that we can trust him. You know, John 17, I think I've told you this before, but it's my favorite chapter in the entire Bible because it's Jesus praying for us specifically. <laughs> How awesome is that? Jesus is praying for us? That's amazing. And we get to hear his words praying for us. But in John 17, 15, paraphrasing again, he's, he's praying and he's, he's talking to the Father and he says that, I don't want you to take them out of the world, but I want to protect them from the evil one. He wants to protect us from the evil one. The fact of the matter is this world is evil. There's a whole lot of evil in it. You know, and it, it seems like it's getting more evil every day. But we have to focus on the, the Father heart of God. You know, we have to focus on the inward issues, especially of ourselves, not the outward appearance per se. Because once we focus on those inward issues and we can help correct those, then we're going to start seeing some serious changes on the outside, right? Right? So, God will lead us through the fire and the flood and through the darkness and uncertainties of this world. We know that this is an absolute truth. It's an absolute fact because he tells us over and over and over in his word that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will lead us down the path of righteousness. He will lead us to streams of living water. He tells us, over and over again, all the good things that he wants for us. Think about the children of Israel whenever they first come out of Egypt, right? They're coming out of Egypt. However, they've been slaves for 400 years. They didn't worship God, Abba Father, that we know of, Yahweh. They didn't worship him then because they were, they were slaves. Whenever people become slaves, they get indoctrinated into the world that they live in. Their, their masters don't want them worshiping the, uh, the gods that they brought with them. They want them worshiping their own gods. Well, Egypt at the time had some serious gods, lots of them, tons of them. And in fact, these gods were somewhat powerful. Because whenever Moses gets there, Moses and Aaron, and he throws the staff down and it turns into a snake, they did the same thing. Boom. The first three things that God had them do, the sorcerers in, in Egypt did the same thing. Now, the sorcerers couldn't, couldn't do the last several though, right? And so it, it, it proved to them that our God is more powerful. Our God is stronger. Our God is greater than anything, any other power in this world. So much greater. But here they are. They're coming out of Egypt, being led by Moses, who still believes in God. And he's trying to teach them as they're going. So God leads them with a fire by day, or I'm sorry, a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's pretty outstanding. He will lead us he will lead us. It's, it, it shows us that he leads. He wants to take us to the promised land. He wants to take us to, uh, to the place of righteousness, to the, uh, to the place that's going to benefit us the absolute most. So if you turn to 1 Timothy, I'm going to remain in 1 Timothy the rest of the day. So if you want, 
you can feel free to jump in there. But I will go back to Jeremiah, but you don't have to go back to Jeremiah. I just want to remind you of the word that God said. If you run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how will you compete with the horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? So keep that in mind. He's asking Jeremiah this stuff. And one thing that I love about our Father God, there are many things, but one thing that I truly love about Him is He answers the questions for us. He gives us the answers. He gives us this roadmap of truth that we can follow. That's part of the way that He never leaves us. It's part of the way that He helps us to understand who He is and helps us to understand His love for us. And so in 1 Timothy, we're going to be in chapter 6, verse 9. There's a little bit of, of loving guidance, a little bit of correction here, and a whole lot of encouragement to help us know where we need to be so that we don't fall down, so that we can run strong, so that we can finish the good fight of faith. It says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation, a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge them into ruin and destruction. I think, Rod, you may have hit on this last week or maybe it was Scott the week before, but for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced, pierced themselves with many griefs. Whew. So he's telling us, if our eyes are fixed on, on achieving worldly things, on just making more money and getting more things, we're going to pierce ourselves with many griefs. I'm not saying that having money, having wealth is bad. It's not. It's absolutely not. In fact, almost all of the major characters in the Bible, the major people um, in the Bible were extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy. Think of King Solomon. He, he amassed more wealth than almost anybody, and he was one of the wisest people. That, he was the wisest to ever live other than Jesus himself. So I'm not saying that having wealth is bad. It's absolutely not bad. But wanting to get rich more than wanting to seek the face of our Father, wanting to know Him intimately, that's whenever we're going to fall into ruin and destruction. So a lot of people are worried about the state of the world that we're in right now because they are worried that, that we're not going to be able to have the, the resources to amass um, wealth that we want. Well, I'm telling you guys, it's not about wealth. It's not about amassing things. It's not about even having, living in a place that provides us uh, freedoms, our God-given rights and our God-given freedoms. Yes, God did give us our rights and our freedoms, and this country is built on the promises of God, is built on the Word of God. But I will also encourage you that at the beginning of 1 Timothy, he's talking about, um, he's talking about slaves being subject to their masters treating them with honor and dignity and respect. These are slaves he's talking about. They don't have any wealth. They don't have any, anything of their own. But God's encouraging them, telling them how they can be happy, how they can be full of jo joy and love and peace. It's not about having things. It's about having this relationship with him. It's not about putting money over God. It's about putting God over everything, everything. So then he goes on in 1 Timothy 6, 11. This is where he starts encouraging, and this is really what I want you guys to focus on. This is really what I want you to start taking out of this because God asked that question, how are you going to run? How are you going to stand? How are you going to move forward in life, no matter what your circumstances are? And this right here is the answer. He says, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession 
in the presence of many witnesses. He's telling them, fight the good fight of faith. And how do you do that? You do that by like what he just said, flee from these things, flee from the love of money, flee from focusing all of your time and, and attention on your surroundings and your circumstances and pursue righteousness. How do we pursue righteousness? How do we get righteousness? God tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. All things will be added unto you. Righteousness is very important to get, and we get that by seeking him first. Godliness. Godliness. When I, when I decided to go into law enforcement, I had a pretty decent relationship with God. We were doing things right, Brittany and I were, and, and leading a small group and stuff like that, but I found myself surrounded by law enforcement officers and those, uh, those people. They're great people, phenomenal people, some of my absolute best friends in the world. However, they don't all cope with things and deal with things in a healthy manner. And the more that you surround yourself with people, the more you're going to start acting like them, the more you're going to start being like them. I'm not saying that we don't be around people that need encouragement. I'm saying if that's all you surround yourself with, you're going to start being like that, okay? It's, it's not as easy to push everybody up than it is to grab hold of them and help pull them up. So, to obtain godliness... We have to keep our eyes and our minds fixed on godliness, on godly things. Surround ourselves with people that are better than us in those areas. Constantly strive for godliness. And then to pursue faith. He tells them to pursue faith. This is Timothy, okay? Jesus had, had just been crucified. Like, uh, I mean, it, it was a little ways, a little while after, but it wasn't like our while after. It wasn't 2,000 years after. It was just recent. But he says, pursue faith. God says that, that blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. Who haven't seen. That's, that's pursuing that faith. Believing that God is who he says he is. That he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Pursue that faith. And then pursue love. Pursue love. That can, it, it sounds so simple, right? It sounds so simple. Pursue love. But love isn't always easy to pursue. Sometimes that's very hard for me, but the greatest two commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. So if we're not pursuing love and we're not pursuing that relationship and allowing God to just ooze out of us so that we can love on people, it can be difficult. So we have to pursue that. And then this is the one that it's, it's really the kicker for me. It's the kicker. Pursue perseverance. Perseverance. That's kind of a tough one, isn't it? I mean, if you really think about it, if you really break it down, he's telling us to pursue, uh, pursue perseverance. Pursue the ability to be able to, to stay the course, to be able to persevere over trials and tribulations, heartaches, hard times, the hard times that are coming. We have to pursue that, guys, because it's, it will get harder. It's not just going to get easier. And sometimes to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our walk in God, we have to go through conflict. We have to go through hard times. Look at the church in China. It's the biggest church in the world, and they're not allowed to be Christians. They get persecuted for being a Christian in China. We don't know what that's like. We want the best thing to come. We want... Uh, the right person to be put in place so that things will be easier for us. But I'm telling you, the church grows under persecution. It does. I don't want persecution. Personally, I do not want it. I absolutely don't. But what I do want is for more people to have the opportunity to know and love our God, our Father, our Savior, who's, who's the creator of life itself, who puts the breath of life in our lungs. Because they might not get that chance otherwise. And then, gentleness. Gentleness. God is working on me and has been for 
almost 17 years <laughs> because he gave me three daughters. And I, I, was, I was born with an older brother, and it was just me and him, and we beat the thunder out of each other. I'm telling you, we would go hide from mom just so we could fight and fight hard. I mean, we'd come back black and blue, bloody. She's like, what happened to you? Oh, I don't know. I fell down. But, and, you know, like, I thought, you know what, God, I want twin boys because I, I'll know how to discipline twin boys. Well, um, he, had a different, he had a different plan in place for me, and I think that it's because he wanted me to pursue gentleness because even the thought of disciplining my daughters absolutely crushes me shreds me, rips me apart. It's the most difficult and painful thing I've ever gone through in my life. And I've gone through some stuff, let me tell you. But these beautiful girls, he gives me beautiful, awesome daughters. And then I have to try to discipline them. That is not easy. So I'm pursuing gentleness because even sometimes the way I look or the way I present myself or the, the tone of voice that I have, even if I don't mean it to be bad, sometimes um, people can take it that I do mean it bad, you know? And especially my daughters, and whenever they, they perceive that as bad, I'm like, I have to learn how to be more gentle. I've got to. And uh, then God also, not only did he give me his word, but he gave me my beautiful bride who helps me and says, you need to be more gentle. So, thank God for her. All right. 1 Timothy 6, 12. We read over this, but there's some stuff that I don't want you guys to miss in it. Fight the good fight of faith. We have to fight. We have to fight for our faith every day because we fight an, an a enemy that doesn't want us to win. And he wants us to have doubts. He wants us to not believe that God is a good God. He doesn't want us to have faith that God wants what's absolutely very best for us and loves us. So it's a fight. It's a fight of faith to hold on to the eternal life to which you were called. You, me, we were called to an eternal life. We were called to eternal life. That is awesome. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You know, one thing that, uh, that I've seen throughout my time in, in different churches and different uh, denominations and stuff is some people, um, whenever you, you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, sometimes they want you to raise your hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Sometimes they just say, you can, you can speak it in your heart. You don't have to, uh, to stand up. We're not going to embarrass you. And sometimes they want you to come right down here to the front. Come on down to the front. Come on down to the front. Well, that's very intimidating for a lot of people. You know what? It's very intimidating for a lot of people, but God tells us that if we don't deny him in front of men, he won't deny us in front of the Father. But if we do deny him in front of men, he will deny us in front of the Father. That's a scary thing, isn't it? So, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, he goes on, and he's giving, he's giving instruction here. He's giving instruction. Don't miss this. He says, command those who are rich in this present world. We are rich in this present world. Everybody sitting in this room is rich in this present world. I promise you that. Most of the country does not have the blessings that we have. Most of the country doesn't have enough money to buy, or not country, but most of the people in the world don't have enough money to, to have a car. Some of them don't have enough money to have a house, let alone a car that you could put gas in it and drive to this nice, comfortable church. I'm telling you, we are rich in this world. Every one of us in here, no matter your situation, no matter how much money you even have in the bank, I'm telling you, you're rich compared to most of the world. So he's giving this command. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain. Wealth is uncertain. Because if the stock market crashes, baby, if you get fired, if you, you know, get embezzled from, if somebody commits fraud, 
and, and get you to give them all their money, like, it's here today and gone tomorrow, right? So, he's saying that this, this wealth is uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Did you hear that God provides everything for our enjoyment? Everything for our enjoyment. So if everything is for our enjoyment, but we don't enjoy everything, maybe we're looking at it wrong. I don't know. Maybe we're not considering the fact that God did create it for our enjoyment. Maybe we need to find the little bitty aspects that are enjoyable in everything. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. I can attest that I have witnessed myself personally that the people in this church that I'm looking at right now, I can't attest to everybody that's online, but I can attest to the people that are in, the, that are in this church are very generous people. All of you are very generous people. You are making the heart of God happy. I promise you, you are. He is happy with you. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. I haven't met anybody in here that's not willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Not as a firm foundation for right now. Did you hear that? Have you ever done something good for somebody and they didn't return the favor? Well, maybe you were doing it for the wrong reason, you know? Maybe you were doing it for the wrong reason. Because right here he says, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation. A firm foundation for the coming age. Not for right now, but for the coming age. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The life that's truly life. That's how we take hold of that life. And that life is truly life. This life, if he says that life is truly life, this life isn't the life we should be focused on. It's not this one. We're focused on the wrong spot, right? So, it, it really caught me off guard this morning whenever you brought everybody up to do the, uh, um, to do the prophetic word. However, I love it. I bet you guys were not so loving it until that first word came out of their mouths, right? But I know Cheyenne and Tracy very well. And I'll tell you, I thought, uh-oh, let's see how this goes. Not, not because I don't believe in the prophetic, I don't believe in prophecy. I do, 100% I believe in prophecy. But I love whenever God kicks us out of our comfort zone and then slaps us in the face and says, I see you. I know what you're going through. I hear you. And I have something for you. Because I know what they're going through. I know that they do have a huge decision to make, that they're in the process of making a huge decision right now. But what's awesome is y'all didn't know that. You didn't know that, did you? No, Michael didn't know that. But the power of the Holy Spirit moves. And his obedience, I'm sitting back there, did I not, Greg? I turned around, looked at him, and I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> I said, that's spot on, dude. That is so spot on. It's exactly what they're going through right now. So thank you for being obedient. Thank the rest of you for being obedient. And being willing to speak out what God's speaking to you. Because that's how God moves in this world. We are his hands and feet. You know, and you can't question it whenever you know something and somebody else didn't know something. And that somebody says something through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't question that. Can you? No. That's truth. And it's God at work. And God is going to continue to do those works in this season to build up our faith. To encourage us. To help us to step out in the spirit and do what he tells us to do, when he tells us to do it, how he tells us to do it. Because we, we don't know what somebody else is going through. 
But God does. And God might just want to use us to be the light into the darkness, to be the light into there, to be an encouragement, to be a hope, to give a hope and a future. I love it. I absolutely love it. So thank you very much, uh, guys, for coming up and doing that. That was awesome. Thank you, Tracy and Cheyenne, for being willing to come up and, uh, and be used like that. Because, you know, being used like that, whether you wanted to be used or not, encourages other people. Amen. And it builds up faith of other people, too. You know, and it helps them to, to realize, wow, God does see me. God does know me. Because all of us, no matter who we are, we go through times in our lives where we wonder, where we question, where we doubt. And that's okay as long as we continue to seek him and let him build us up, let him strengthen us. God can handle our questions. He really can. So why don't we stand and we will uh, we'll close in some prayer. <clears throat> As we close, if anybody does feel like the, the Spirit of God is moving on them to, to do something, to say something, to, um, to whatever, if you feel the Spirit of God moving you or leading you, guiding you, directing you to do something, I just want to encourage you to do it because now is the time. Now's the time, not tomorrow, not next week. Now's the time. Walt, if you want to throw on the music, you can. Greg, just keep it down low. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your spirit, that you have given us your power and your ability to be able to love even whenever we feel like that we don't have that ability. God, I pray that you will open up our minds, open up our eyes to receive from you, to be willing to receive from you your power, your strength. Lord, give us, give us the ability to receive from you the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Give us the ability to be obedient, to be able to display the fruits of your Holy Spirit, God. God, today I pray for peace over every single person in here. And I command the spirit of fear to leave every single person's mind that's within the sound of my voice, whether it's in this building or whether it's online. I command the spirit of fear to leave in Jesus' mighty name. We take back the dominion and the authority over our minds. And God, we give that to you, Lord. I pray that you will help us to fill our minds with the things of you, God. Fill our minds with righteousness. Fill our minds with the things that you want us to have. And I just speak a spirit of peace over this place that surpasses all understanding. Over every single person in this building and online. A spirit of peace to penetrate into their hearts. And cast out fear in Jesus' name. Lord, replace that, those, those areas that we had fear, replace that with love, God. Because your word says that perfect love cast out all fear. It cast it out, Lord. So fill us up with your love, God. Fill us up with your goodness, your kindness, your gentleness, your faithfulness, your meekness, your self-control, your peace, Lord. God, we just want to provide you a time to move. We just want to be still in your presence and allow you to come, allow you to just move on us, God. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will rest in this place just like you did in the, in the room on the day of Pentecost. I pray that your Holy Spirit will just, just move on us, God, that you will just rest on us and empower us to operate in your gifts and in your, in your spirit, Lord.